to our service. This is the eighth week of our online services at Lisburn IMC and I'd just like to welcome you wherever in the world you are, whether you're connected to the church or not, um, to our time of fellowship tonight. We'll be hearing a word of testimony from Julianne, we'll be hearing ministry and song from Victoria Salt and we'll be opening God's word in the book of Acts. But before we do that, let's just still our hearts and pray. Dear God, thank you for this opportunity for us as a church to meet together, although not physically together, Lord, but spread around the country, Lord. Um, thank you for blessing us with the technology and the means of communication, Lord, that we are able to continue in this way. And although it's not perfect, we thank you and praise you for the opportunities that come along with that. We pray tonight, Lord, as we hear the uh, word of testimony from Julianne, that you will really bless the words that she has to say and that it would resonate with many, Lord, and that we'd be able to connect with that story, Lord, that story of faith and that journey of salvation. And we pray for the word from the book of Acts, Lord, that um, the words would challenge and encourage us, Lord, and that if there's anyone who has not yet put their faith in Jesus, that they may be struck by something that is said tonight, Lord. We pray for the kids' talks in the morning, Lord, and we thank you for um, how they've been going out and for young people of the fellowship, Lord, the young people of the church, we pray for encouragement for them at this time. And we thank you for, even as James has been doing the Thursday night teen search classes, Lord, um, we pray that you would really bless those times of learning for the young people and that they may be able to draw closer to you. Dear Lord, we pray for this, um, this global coronavirus pandemic, Lord, we pray that you would bring it to a swift end, Lord, and that the pain and the suffering felt by so many around the world would be eased, Lord. We even thank you for the vulnerable in our society at this time, Lord, for um, those who are homeless, for those who are in tough um, situations in their houses, Lord, whether that's through domestic abuse or anything like this, Lord. We just pray for these people, that you would 
minister on to them, Lord, and give them peace and the help that they need in this tough time. So we pray just for the service now as it goes out on YouTube, Lord, and um, that it would bring glory and honour onto you. For in your name we pray. Amen. Uh, I'm Julianne, for those that maybe don't know me. Um, and the pastor just asked me just to share a little word um, of testimony. So I thought I'd begin by um, just sharing a verse from Proverbs chapter 8 um, and 35. It was a little verse that came up in my Bible readings um, just at the start of this whole lockdown period. Um, and it's just the first line really struck me. It says, For whoso findeth me findeth life. Um, and that verse, when I read it, um, felt particularly relevant um, for the time that we're in at the moment, um, under lockdown. Um, I don't take for granted um, for one moment that I was brought up in a Christian home, surrounded by church and Christian influences from a very young age. Um, and it was as a result of that teaching um, at church and the prayers of um, the prayers and influences of family members um, and church friends um, that I prayed a very simple prayer um, at the age of eight, um, asking Christ into my life. It was a simple prayer, um, but it was genuine faith. Um, and I'm so thankful um, that God forgave me that day um, and that he put in my heart um, the desire to get to know him more and to serve him. Um, and I would have to say that really throughout um, my, my Christian life since then, um, growing up through school, um, living as a Christian perhaps wasn't as difficult as it might be for some. Um, I'm very aware that the Christian journey is, is very different um, depending on each person. And for me, I was um, blessed to be surrounded by um, Christian friends at school and those who could encourage and um, build me up in my faith. Um, and I'm so thankful as well to um, just the, the teaching and, and support and guidance that I got, even just from the church growing up, um, whether it was through Lifeliners or Fishers or Sunday School or Bible class, um, so many whose, whose lives um, influenced me and helped really to shape um, my teenage years. Um, but I don't really want to give you um, a sort of timeline view of, of my Christian life since then. Um, I really just wanted to draw out a couple of lessons that I've really felt that God has been um, teaching me throughout the past um, number of years and, and throughout university um, as well. Um, the first one brings to mind um, a little verse of a poem that my grandparents have often quoted to me down through the years. Um, and it goes like this. It says, he knows, he loves, he cares. Nothing this truth can dim. He gives the very best to those who leave the choice with him. Um, as anyone who knows me will know very well, I'm not the world's best decision maker. Um, and many times um, down through the years, I've found myself echoing the words um, of Psalm 143 um, and verse 8, where it says, cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, um, especially when it comes to decisions about um, things like jobs and, and where to live. Um, I have often um, found it difficult just to wait on God um, and to leave the choice with him and trust his guidance. Um, but every time um, throughout the last couple of years that I have come to a decision um, that has been important, I've just found the words of Psalm 142 and verse 3 seem to come back time and time again. Um, it says, when my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. Um, and I find that to be so true, um, especially just even finishing university and thinking about what to do next, um, or just lots of little decisions that we face um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, for any young person um, out there who, who might be just struggling with knowing what it is um, God wants them to do and, and finding God's will for their life, um, waiting on God, um, and leaving the choice with him is always the best decision that we can ever make. And I've just found that to be so true time and again. Um, I've just finished um, reading the biography of Lilius Trotter, um, who was a pioneer worker to North Africa um, in the early 20th century. And um, Lilius Trotter's book is just such a real life example of what it is um, to wait on God's best um, and to seek him in all areas of our lives, even when at times that waiting and that seeking might seem fruitless and uncertain. Um, and there was just one particular passage of her book that really stood out to me. It's, it's when she describes um, the Christian life sometimes as stepping out into a mist, um, grasping for something that you can't quite see um, but you believe to be there, looking for God's will and God's guidance, even when it's difficult to see. And then she says, then all of a sudden the mist lifts and as the clouds vanish, you see a trail of his footprints 
that were there all along. Um, and that little extract just reminded me um, so much of the words of Job 23 and verse 10, but he knoweth um, the way that I take. Um, I've also found at times that um, when we're looking for God's guidance in our lives, um, sometimes leaving the choice with him has meant giving up things that I have perhaps found um, importance in or, or, or held valuable. Um, often not even harmful things, but good things that have just crept in to take um, the place of the best thing. Um, and sometimes I find that leaving the choice with God can be a struggle um, and sometimes even painful um, as he asks, as he has asked me um, to maybe give up things like um, certain hobbies or, or friendships that, that haven't been um, uh, really building up my Christian walk. Um, but then again, um, those words of Job ring true, um, that God does know the way that we take. Um, and even when it seems difficult, his way is always best. He has promised not to withhold any good thing. Um, to those who walk uprightly and that has just been such a promise um, for me down through the years um, and the other thing I've just really um, felt that God has has opened my eyes to um, especially in the last couple of years with um, with moving to London to start working life has just been the great need um, of of those around us whether it's um, those in, just in our immediate um, vicinity those we work alongside and live with um, or even just around the world. Um, and I've always had an interest in what God is doing in other parts of the world. And I think that has partly come about um, because uh, the vast part of my childhood and teenage years, um, my dad um, was involved in full-time missionary work. Um, and that meant that our house was always full of um, visitors, um, often from Eastern Europe, often from further afield. And so even as a child looking on, I realised and began to understand the value um, of full-time work um, and the challenges um, that it that it involves. Um, and so through that little spark that, that started off, um, I had the opportunity to go out on a number of summer teams um, throughout the years, um, mostly with my, with my dad. Um, and I can really say that those were um, pivotal experiences um, just in my Christian life um, in terms of opening my eyes to um, to to the need around me as well as seeing what people were doing about that need and and just seeing the um, just seeing the godly examples um, of those who who were seeking to really give up everything um, for Christ um, and that continued even um, just in the last couple of years I've had the opportunity to help out with camps and things and and through those um, camps I've I've come across many individuals who um, have really challenged me and influenced me in my Christian walk, probably without even knowing it, um, just through their godly lives um, and kind words of wisdom and advice. Um, throughout university, I really enjoy being part of a, a number of um, mission prayer groups um, and getting involved in various mission activities with the Christian Union. Um, but throughout the last couple of years living in London, I've just come across so many people, um, many young um, new graduates my own age, who... I just have so many questions um, and perhaps nowhere in the UK um, is the world more on our doorstep than central London um, and it's just been so eye-opening to see um, to see people really searching um, and I just praise God that even in the last couple of years I've had the opportunity to share my faith with a number of my colleagues um, and my close friends and um, some of whom have even come out to church with me um, and begun looking into Christianity for themselves. Um, throughout the past couple of years and, and indeed my entire Christian walk, um, I have really found that verse in Proverbs to be true. For whoso findeth me, findeth life. Um, life in Christ um, is life to the full. Um, it's life abundant um, as he promises to give. Um, I trust if you don't know him, um, you will seek him and you will find him and with him you will find life in its fullest. Acts 16 verses 25 to 31 and midnight Paul and Sar Silas prayed and sang praises unto God and the prisoners heard them and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and every one's bands were loosened and the keeper of the prison awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open he drew his sword and would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had fled but 
Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, and sprang in, and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Good evening. We're very glad that you are able to join with us as we turn again to the Word of God that has been read for us tonight. We're looking at one of the most remarkable life transforming encounters with the power of the Gospel uh, that we find in the book of Acts. Uh, the conversion of the Philippine jailer, Paul and Silas uh, came uh, after receiving the call from a man to come over to Macedonia and help us. And as they responded in obedience to the call of God to bring the gospel to the region of Philippi, uh, we, they encountered a very influential businesswoman who was transformed by the power of the gospel. The Bible says that God opened Lydia's heart. And her life was changed and she became uh, one of the Christians uh, that opened her, her home uh, to share the love of Christ with others. And we have also the story of a young girl who was demon possessed. A spirit of deception and a spirit of divination uh, who had possessed her and she was following Paul and Silas and Paul being grieved. Uh, commanded in the name of Jesus that the demons depart from her and she was set free and totally delivered in a moment of time. Those who had profited from her and uh, who had exploited her uh, were mad that they had lost uh, the potential of their business and uh, they stirred up the people. There was an uproar. Paul and Silas were taken before the magistrates and they were uh, uh, commanded to be beaten and thrown into the inner or into the prison, and so we find uh, that this uh, we are introduced to the Philippine jailer. We're not told very much about him, other than we, what we read here in this passage of scripture. He was employed by the Roman government to uh, keep, lock prisoners up and keep them safe, and he, because he was given this charge, he took Paul and Silas. And he thrust them into uh, the most secure part uh, of the prison. Uh, I want us to trace uh, the record about this man's exceptional encounter uh, and experience of God's salvation. This man, perhaps uh, as we look at his life, would have been very, very aggressive uh, in his attitude toward Paul and Silas if they had have come to him to try to share the gospel with him. He was a very cruel, uh, wicked man. Uh, we recognise that it may have been that uh, he was the one who was responsible for carrying out uh, the execution of the, uh, the, the, the whipping and uh, the beating of Paul and Silas. Uh, they would have been taken and beaten Paul talks in another portions of scripture about how in, in three different occasions he was beaten with 39 stripes right to the very maximum ascendance. His back would have been torn to pieces. And here is Paul taken broken and bleeding and he's brought into the inner prison. Now, we can hardly imagine that the darkness, the filth, the stench, uh, uh, the, 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 the darkness of this place that Paul and Silas were taken to the most secure part of the prison and then their feet were put into the stocks we read in the story of Joseph and that Joseph was taken prisoner and his feet were hurt with fetters of iron and we get a little picture of the the discomfort the injustice the pain the suffering that Paul and Silas had suffered even at the hand of this jailer and yet we see the callous cold heart of this man he locked the door and he went off to his his bed uh, 
perhaps uh, uh, his residence in the same part of the prison. Uh, and uh, there he went to bed and the Bible tells us that he went to sleep. He slept, as we would say, like a baby. Other prisoners were disturbed by the singing of Paul and Silas at midnight. But this man heard nothing. He was out for the count, as we would say. He was fast asleep. This heartless man, after inflicting pain, could just switch it all off without any feeling of sympathy, without even a thought or, or any compassion in his heart to those who, who he had inflicted the maximum amount of pain and, and brought into the darkness of this horrendous prison. And yet we find that God began to work in his life and there was a conviction that he needed to feel. There was a conviction that he needed to feel. You see, dear friend, if you and I are to experience the wonder of God's salvation, we need to come under conviction. We need to sense our need. We need to be aware of our lost estate. I know that there are many of us and uh, we wouldn't go to the doctor unless we were really sick. And sometimes perhaps we would uh, put it off as long as we could until it came to the place that we were desperate and we knew that we had to go. A man walking down a beach on a sunny day is not really going to be walking down calling for help. Well, that same man uh, comes uh, to a part of the beach where there's quicksand and unknowingly steps out into this quicksand and sinks down uh, to his chest and, 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 and it continues to sink. And, and the more he struggles and the more he tries, he goes deeper, deeper into that pit. Then he, he unashamedly begins to cry out because he feels the, his, his need. And here is this man and prior to this moment in his life where he encounters God, he had no sense of his need. His heart was hard. His heart was wicked. He was a callous, cold, wicked, cruel man who could walk away from the pain that he had inflicted and put his head upon a pillow and go to sleep without a thought of God without an anxiety or, or concern about the things that he had done that were wrong and cruel. Here's a man, and we read this passage of Scripture, he had no thought of God, and he had no thought of eternity. Whenever he saw that the prison doors were open, he was going to take his own life. He had no thought of what it really would mean to go out into eternity without God, to take your own life and go out into a lost eternity. And the horrors of being eternally lost. Here's a man who had no consciousness of his need. The Bible tells us that when he saw uh, the, the prison doors open, the keeper of the prison wakened out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, drew out his sword and would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had fled. But Paul had a message for this man. God had been preparing this man's heart and awakening him out of his sleep. And Paul cried with a loud voice, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. The conviction did not come from the earthquake. Because after the earthquake, he was going to take his own life. But we realize that he discovered something that awakened his heart. His life up until this point was cruel and wicked. Now that he thought that the prisoners had escaped, he thought his life wasn't worth living and there was no hope for him. But whenever Paul said, do thyself no harm, we are all here. Something was awakened in his heart. Something happened to this man in his thinking and in his mind. There was a power that was revealed in that prison. And this man came seeking. Why is it that these prisoners, when their chains have fallen off, and whenever the doors are swung widely open, why have they not fled? 
Why have they not sought freedom? Why have they not escaped for their life? What is it that holds these men in the inner prison with Paul and Silas? Not one of these men escaped. And here is a man and God awakens his heart to realize there is something here that I don't really understand. There is something missing in my life and I need answers. I, I, th there's a desperate need. Here are men and they have something that I don't have. And the Bible tells us that he came. What was it that these men had? Paul and Silas. They said, lift, lifted up their voice and said, do thyself no harm for we are all here. We find not only a conviction that he felt. The Bible says that he came trembling. This man is really feeling conviction. There's a real sense of his need. Uh, his life is, is now trembling. Recognizing that there is something desperately wrong in his life. Not only the conviction that he felt. But there's a question that needed to be asked. The Bible says he called for a light and springing in, he came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? You see, dear friend, the scripture reminds us that, there, that your soul needs to be saved. Sin has separated you from God. You're the one who is imprisoned. You're the one who is a slave to sin. The God of this world, the Satan, has blinded your mind, lest the light of the glorious gospel. The Bible says because of sin we are dead in trespasses and sins. We are lost. We're blind. And we're powerless. If you could stand at the edge of a pit, that was a thousand feet deep. You could stand there totally unafraid. Right at the very precipice of that plinth. If you were blind. You could stand there without a tremor. Without any fear. Because you couldn't see the danger. You couldn't see that one more step. Would take you crashing down. And your body would be smashed. On the sharp stones as you fell uh, down into the depth of that pit to your death. You would have no fear. But do you find the moment that your eyes would be opened? It is a foolish man who would not tremble. It is a strange man who sees that one more step will take him down into uh, th th this awful chasm. Do you find we find in Scripture that there are those who know not Christ as Savior? And the Bible tells us that they are under condemnation. The Bible tells us that they are lost, that they're dead, that there's uh, all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And yet, dear friend, even though you don't realize that maybe even the next day, the next step, the next moment, you could go out into a lost eternity. You need your eyes opened to recognize your true condition. But dear friend, whenever your eyes are open, we find in this passage of Scripture not only did this man have a conviction that he felt, but there was a question that he needed to ask. There's a question that he needed to ask. This question is asked in the context of real concern. This is not just a casual question. Here is a man trembling. Here's a man concerned. Here's a man anxious. And dear friend, when you come concerned and anxious about your soul and you ask questions, God will reveal himself to you. You see, dear friend, there's a question that needed to be asked because the Bible reveals to us that we are blind. We could never, all we like sheep have gone astray. The Bible tells us that we are separated from God. And if you ask the, uh, the, a natural man how he can, can be right with God, if I were to take a hundred people and ask a hundred people 
uh, how to get to heaven, I could get a hundred different answers. You see, dear friend, the Bible teaches us that there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And we need to ask the right question. What must I do to be saved? You see, dear friend, you need to be saved. And there is only one person who can save. Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners. His name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name uh, given unto men uh, under heaven whereby they must be saved. The Lord Jesus Christ is able to save to the uttermost all that come unto God by him. See, dear friend, you and I need to be saved, saved from the guilt and the shame and the condemnation of sin. Saved from our own impotence and powerlessness to change the habits of our lives. Uh, saved from the power that works uh, in us uh, to uh, drive us in rebellion against God. Saved from the consequences of living in disobedience to the word of God. Saved from the wrath to come and the judgment of God. Bible does remind us that we need to be saved and we need to ask this question well how can I what must I do to be saved here is a man and, and to experience deliverance for him it meant being brought to a place where he felt conviction of his need and when he is caused to ask the question because he knew he, knew he needed to be saved I don't know all that he would have heard. And no doubt he would have heard about Paul and Silas and how they had brought this message of salvation and how this woman Lydia was saved and how this young girl was saved by the power of the gospel. How, how he looked at the life of Paul and Silas and saw despite the pain and the suffering and the injustice, they were able to sing and praise God in the midst of the darkest hour of their lives. But here is a man and he comes and he asks the question, what must I do to be saved? And we recognize that Paul gave him this answer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved on thine house. Uh, you see, dear friend, you will never be saved by your, the, the prayers that you pray or by the sorrow that you feel or by the earnestness by which you repent uh, or by the sincerity of your desires. The only one who can save and the only thing that will save is when God, through Jesus Christ, does a work of grace in your life. Jesus must save. Jonah recognized salvation is of the Lord. It's not your prayers that will save you. It's not your good living that will save you. It's not your earnestness that will save you. It is the desperate cry that recognize that only Jesus Christ can save. And if you are to be saved, he is the one who must save. He is the one. And you need to cast all of your trust and your faith in Jesus Christ uh, through his death and resurrection to receive the gift of eternal life. Salvation is by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not what you do. It's not what I do. What Christ has done on the cross and what Christ offers to you to freely forgive you and to give you a, a, a new heart and a new life to give you by his grace, his righteousness, to make you a new creature, to change your life. And so we see here is a man, and it wasn't until he was brought to a place where he felt his need, that he was able to understand the answers to the real question in life. What must I do to be saved? You can't do anything other than look to Christ and to trust in him. And we find in this man's life there was a real experience of God's salvation. How do we know that this man uh, had not relied upon uh, anything else other than the person of the Lord Jesus Christ? We see the change that he experienced. 
Here we find this man and he brought Paul and Silas out at midnight. And, and he brought them out into his house. What did he want? What, did, what was he, he doing in the middle of the night? He, he was hearing the word of God. He wanted to hear God's word. I tell you, dear friend, when, when your heart has been changed from rejecting the word of God to eagerly, even though it's in the middle of the night, longing to know and experience from the word of God, to hear truth, to receive truth. He demonstrated a real change of heart. Here's a man whose cruel hands had inflicted wounds. But now those hands, taking a sponge and like a nurse, tenderly washing the stripes of Paul and Silas. What a change. A whole transformation in this man's life. He obeyed the instructions of the word of God. He believed and he was baptized. He wanted his whole family to know about Jesus. And he took a public stand in following the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's a man and he experienced God's salvation. He was brought to a place uh, where he was uh, awakened to the danger of his soul. Oh dear friend, may God awaken you to recognise that you need to experience God's salvation yourself. You need to be saved. You need to be born again of the Spirit of God. You need the past blotted out. Only Jesus Christ can save. Only Christ can forgive. Only God can save your soul. And you need to ask the right question. You need to recognise uh, how you can know that you're saved. You need to come seeking salvation. A prayer, uh, having prayer prayed is not enough. You need Christ to come and he is able to save. Uh, the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe and be saved. You see, dear friend, it's not of works that we have done. But according to his mercy, he saves us. And no matter who you are, no matter where you are, this very night, if you recognize that your only hope is in Christ and you come to him and trust him and ask him to be your savior, to save your soul, then he is able to save you if you will trust him. And you can know that you have been changed by the power of God and brought into a right relationship with God. I trust that you will experience God's salvation. If I can be of any help to you, please contact us. We would love to show you the promises of God that is given in his word. May God bless his word to our hearts. Can we bow again, please, in, in a moment of prayer. Our loving Father, we thank you Paul could say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth. We pray for those who are awakened and seeking today, that, Lord, that you will bring them to the place where they know and, Father, they experience the reality of God's salvation. So set your seal upon your word for Jesus' sake. When I fear my faith will fail, he will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is all told me fast he will hold me fast he will hold me fast for my savior loves me 
Those he saves are his delight. Christ will hold me fast, precious in his holy sight. He will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last. But by him at such a cost, he must hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. For my life he bled and died. Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast, raised with him to endless life. He must hold me fast till our faith is turned to sight. When he comes at last, he will hold me fast. He will hold Fuck.